Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inusor Education. Um, today we continue um, solving very simple logical problems. Sometimes uh, it's about many problems, but each of them is simple. Some, some, sometimes I uh, present a little bit more difficult problem, uh, but only one for the lecture. Like the previous lecture was about uh, it was called Logical 7, that's about Einstein's uh, riddle. Very, very nice problem, actually. But today will be much simpler problems, but uh, five of them, right? Five. Okay. Now, this lecture is part of the course called Math Plus and Problems, presented on Unisor.com. I do suggest you to watch the lecture from the website, because every lecture has uh, it's side by side the, the video uh, recorded and uh, textual uh, notes for the same lecture. And the textual notes is like a textbook basically. So you have presentation, like live presentation of the lecture, and then the same material, like in a textbook style, very detailed, um, presented uh, on the next page. And, um, well, sometimes solutions to the problems. I do not present if they are really simple. So its solution is only on the lecture, but the problem itself is in the textual part as well. And it's very important actually for you to try to solve these problems yourself. Obviously, it's uh, very beneficial if you listen to somebody else's solution, which I am suggesting, but it would be much better if you do it yourself and you solve the problem yourself especially if you will not only solve it, but also write it down in as many details as possible. So nobody can ask you why you say this. So every statement must be supported by some kind of a logical explanation. All right. Now, there are other courses on the same website. There is a prerequisite course, which is called Math for Teens. Now, this is basically high school level mathematics, maybe a little bit higher, but this is a lot of theory in, in that course, all the theorems and uh, all the properties, etc. So that's a prerequisite to solving the problems. Um, okay, so let's just do it one by one. And again, as I was saying, simple, simple, simple problems. First problem. You have a train between A and B trains goes both way. Now, it is known that the trains are always maintaining the same speed in both directions and always maintain the same interval between trains uh, in both directions. Now, you are sitting in this train which goes from A to B and as you go you saw the trains which are coming in the opposite direction every 10 minutes you have a train passing by into opposite direction from B to A now the question is how many trains are coming from B to A into point A during one hour so you have one hour Well, this is a good actual point for you to pause, so whenever I'm finishing presenting the problem, pause it and think about it yourself. Okay, now, what is the solution? Well, the solution is actually very simple. Now, you are moving towards B, and the trains are moving in the opposite direction. So what does it mean? It means that the relative speed of the train which goes um, in an opposite direction relative to this particular observer, well, the speed is the same, right? Just opposite direction. So the speed doubles, actually. So if you consider this from the point of view of uh, this particular passenger, which goes from A to B, the speed of the train from B to A is twice as, as big as it's really relative to the uh, ground, right? Or relative to any of the stations, A or B. Since the speed is the same in both directions, right? Which means if you 
do not actually uh, go with this train. If you are standing still somewhere in uh, at any point between A and B, if you're just standing there and you see the tra trains from B to A, well, the speed will be half, which means that the distance between trains will be double. So the distance between trains for a, 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 a stationary observer is every 20 minutes. So every 20 minutes the train from B to A will be passed relative to a stationary uh, observer. Well, if it's every 20 minutes, it means that within an hour observer will see three trains. So three trains within an hour are passing by any observer and including observer which stands at point A, so the trains are coming into A um, three times an hour, every 20 minutes. That's it. Simple, right? All of those are as simple. Okay, now, uh, crime was committed and there are three suspects, A, B, and C. Only one of them committed the crime. Now, they are saying something about who did it. Um, so A said, B did it. B said, I am innocent. C said the same thing, I am innocent. Now, it's also known that only one person tells the truth, and two are liars. Well, now the question is who did it? Again, pause the video, think about it yourself, and I will um, present the solution. Okay, let's just assume that A is saying the truth. What does it mean? Well, if he says the truth, it means B did it. Okay, so B did it. Then, B is a liar. B is lying. Now C, C says I am innocent, but that's the truth, right? Because B did it. So C is truthful. So we have one truthful and another truthful. We have two truthful people, but only one is supposed to be truthful according to the condition of the problem. So A is not saying the truth. So A is lying. Okay, so A is lying. What does it mean? It means B didn't do it. It means B is truthful. Because he says he's innocent. And from this we have already truthful person. Now, question is, if A is lying, so it's, it's actually, uh, so B is innocent, so it's either A or C committed the crime, correct? So who committed the crime, A or C? Well, A can commit the crime, because he said that B did it and this is a lie. Now, C is supposed to be lying, because we have only one and he says he is innocent. So that means that C has committed the crime. C did it. And in this particular case, everything is fine because A is lying. He says B did it, but in, in theory C did it. 
Now B is telling the truth, and only B is telling the truth. He says he is innocent. Now C committed the crime and says he is innocent, so he is also lying. So everything is okay. We have only one truthful person, and we have one who committed the crime. So check completely all the conditions of the problem. So we have only one truthful person, which is B. We have one person and only one person who is um, uh, committed the crime, and we have two liars. Because if it's not C who committed the crime, if it's A, then um, we will have C also telling the truth, which is the second person, and we cannot have it. So there is only one solution to this problem. C did it. Okay, that's it. Next. Next is the problem of the following. We have three numbers. One, two, three, four numbers. One, two, three, and four. And we have a condition, an equation actually. A, B, C, and D. These are numbers, integer numbers from 1 to 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. But I don't know which one. I have to guess, basically, which one. To satisfy this particular equation. Again, pause the video and think about how to approach it. Well, first of all, there are only uh, 4 factorial, which is 24, different ways you can position four numbers, one, two, three, and four, in some order, and you can substitute, for instance, one, two, three, and four. Let's check. 16 uh, and 12 is, is what? 28 and uh, 4, 32 and 133. Obviously, it doesn't satisfy. So, there are other way you can put it. For instance, 4, 3, 2, and 1, and check. So you can do all these 24 different checks and eventually you will come up with a solution. So there is a solution, I mean, obviously. Otherwise I wouldn't give it to you, right? So that's one of the ways and that's how computers actually would probably solve this particular equation. If you will make a program to solve the equation, equation of this type in integer and you know all the different uh, variations, computer will just start pumping through all these calculations, it will have all the 24 uh, different ways of positioning our four numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 3, 4, 2, etc., etc., and it will find. That's not nice. So what I'm saying is that try to think about some ways to do it a little bit more, well, effectively or smartly, actually, right? So, how can we approach this problem in a little better way than the computers would probably do it? Obviously, we should not really start from this. Um, I suggest the following way. Why don't we start with D and start from the maximum, 4, and check if it might actually work. So, that would reduce the number of different ways we, can, um, we, have, we have to check the calculations. So, the first of all, I will start with d is equal to 4 and see what happens. Well, if d is equal to 4, I have to equation a plus 2b plus 3c equals, if this is 16, so this is 6. Now, but only if a and b and c are equal to 1, that would be 6. But we don't have all three of them equal to 1. We have 1, 2, and 3 available, right? Our numbers are A, B, C, D belong to 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's not all of them 1, obviously. So if one of them is a little bit more than 1, that's it. We will not have 6. So that actually completely negates all the combinations where D is equal to, um, to 4. And there are six of them, right? Because there are six ways to position one, two, and three in different places. It's three factorial, right? Okay, so that's definitely reduced 
by 6. Now let's try 3. Now if it's 3 then a plus 2b plus 3c equals to 3, 12, 10, right? Okay. Now we have three numbers, 1, 2 and 3. How can I position them uh, to basically uh, come up with 10? Well, let's start with c. Obviously, if c is equal to 3, it doesn't work already, because it's already 9, and it would be, I cannot make it 10. So, let's try 2 and 1. So, if, if c is equal to 2, then I have 1 and 3. Well, if it's 3 and 1, or 1 and 3, I don't know. Well, let's try, let's try 1 and 3. So what, what will be? 3 times 2 would be 6. 2 times 3 would be 6. Well, it's already greater. Okay, so 1 and 3 is not working. How about 3 and 1? 6, 2 and 1 is 2, 1 and 3 is 3, 11. Still too much. Okay, so cannot really make it with d is equal to 3. And let's try next one, d is equal to 2. Then a plus 2b plus 3c is equal to what? If it's 2, it's 8, uh, it's 14. And uh, we have what's available. If g is equal to 2, I have a, b, and c are 1, 3, and 4, right? 2 is already taken. Okay, now, again, let's start from the biggest one. Well, 4 definitely not, not working because it's 12 and we cannot really make it less than 14. Okay, now, if it's 3, then I have 9 and I have what? 1 and 4 are supposed to be equal to 14. Well, 1 and 4. Well, obviously it's not 1 and 4, maybe it's 4 and 1. So that would be 4 and 2, it's 6, it's 15. Too much. So C cannot be 3. And cannot be 4. Uh, so maybe it's 1. Let's check 1. And 3 and 4 would be here. Uh, now, I need, I need 14, right? So if it's... Uh, if it's c is 1, so I have 3 and 4. Um, all right, 3 and 4. So if this is 3 and this is 4, I have 11, which is small. And if it's 3 and 4, it's 8. Uh, 8, it's 8 and 3, 11, and, and 3, 14. So that looks like a solution, right? So d is equal to, d is equal to 2, and then, so d is equal to 2, then c is equal to 1, a is equal to 3 and 4. That looks like a solution, right? Let's check it again. It's 3 times 8 plus 8, so it's 11, plus 3 is 14, plus 8 is 22. Correct. So we have come up with a solution. So how many, like 4 or 5 different calculations instead of 24? That's all I'm saying. Now, um, if you want, you can obviously check for g is equal to 1 and see analogously if there is a solution. Actually, I checked. There is no other solutions. So anyway, we have come up with the first solution relatively quickly in five or six calculations. And uh, another couple of calculations, and you will make sure that it's only one solution. So that's my point, actually. So using some smart logic, you can reduce the number of calculations um, which, which, which you really have to do. Now, analogously, I remember the time when uh, people were trying to teach computers to play chess.
and there were actually two different schools of doing it. One was just do it with a computer, all the number crunches, all the different variations without any kind of a thinking about, let's see what happens if I will do this move. Another school of thought was, okay, let's just think about position. Let's make a weight for every position, how good the position is, and make only these uh, moves and check only those moves which increase the value of the position. And in the beginning, when the computers were really very, very slow, the first school, which was actually trying to go through all the different combinations, was not producing good results. And the school, which was actually doing something smart from their perspective, they were successful. But as the computers got a little bit more powerful, um, the logic uh, of uh, m making smart moves um, well, it wasn't really perfect, obviously, but if you go through all the calculations and all the different variations, inevitably you will come up with the best result. And uh, basically, the first school, which was doing this brute force calculations, kind of won because, well, because it's a brute force and the computers are really very, very fast. So that's basically the com competition between the man and the computer. All right, <coughs> next problem. Very simple. So you have a box and you have balls. You have balls of red and blue in the box. So what's known is the following. I will just write it down. Only one ball is not red. And second one, all balls except one are blue. Question is how many reds and how many blues? Again, uh, pause the video and think about this. But the logic is very simple. If only one ball is not red, well, not red means blue, right? So we have one blue ball. We already know that there is only one blue ball from the first condition. Now, if all balls except one are blue, so all balls are one except one, which is not blue, which is red actually, so we have only one red. So the answer is we have one blue and one red balls in the box to satisfy these both conditions. Simple, right? Okay. And the last problem is kind of arithmetic, but it's a, it, it, it's a problem which actually expressed in words and you have to translate it into um, algebraic equation if you wish. So you have a table and you have a bottle on the table and book on the floor. And the distance between top of the book and top of the bottle is 100, let's say, centimeters or whatever. But if you will change the places, you will have the same table, you will have the bottle here and the book here. Then the difference between top and top is 50 centimeters. So this is the bottle on the top and the table, is, uh, the, the book is uh, on the floor and this is the bottle on the floor and the uh, book is on the top. Question is, what's the height of the table? Okay, now pause the video, think about this and my solution is the following. Let's say table's height is T and the bottle is X and the book is Y. So, what do we have here? The table plus X, but with without Y. That's equal to 100. In this case, the table plus book 
but minus uh, height of the, t uh, of the bottle is 50. And we have to find the table. Ta we have to find the T. Well, the easy solution is add them up to T. Y and X are cancelling out 150 from which from which T is equal to 75. That's it. Okay, that's it for today. I do suggest you to read all the problems in the textual part. You go to unizor.com, go to course mass plus and uh, and problems, go to logic. This is logic 08, and you have all the conditions and some solutions. So I suggest you to repeat basically all these solutions just by yourself. Do not read the solution. If it exists over there, try to solve it yourself and then check. That's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck.